So Mark, here we are back by popular demand. <laughs> uh, One person said, where's the Q&A this month? <laughs> yeah, go on. <laughs> uh, anyway, pre-season seems to fly by now, doesn't it? Yeah. You know, it used to be seem so long, but now we're through Thank it. God. Thank God for me, because uh, I miss the football, to be honest. The pre-season comes back, I enjoy a couple of the games, and then I just can't really wait to get started back into the real thing. Um, so for me, it's any time without football's bad time. And so pre-season's just like the phony war as such, isn't it? So I'm just quite happy for it to go straight in the league and, and get on with it. But you had the World Cup, of course. Yeah, it's not the same as watching Pompey though, is it? Anyway, let's, with any further ado, get on with it. Yeah. Um, first one, and are your words gonna come back to haunt you here? I don't think so, but let's have a, let's have a look. In the summer, you released a video asking us to wait and see the big things that were happening over the summer. What things were you talking about? Have they all been achieved? Pretty much everything that we set out to do over the summer, um, we did achieve. Um, massive rebranding of the, of the stadium, you know, inside and out. Still a lot of work on going there that, that we'll be carrying on during the season. We had the Nike deal was announced that we've been working on commercially for a year and great work by you know, our board of directors, Anna Mitchell, Tony Brown, you know, really everyone pulled together to, to get that deal done, which was no mean feat really. Um, new um, front shirt sponsor, University of Portsmouth. Again, I think further strengthening our brand and our standing within the community and, and out there pr promoting the city as a whole, which is what we're always keen to do. Club shop, amazing. I think, you know, I've not heard anyone have a bad word to say about the club shop. So pretty, pretty universally well respected there, aligned with the ticket office moving over. New big screen, again, I think absolutely looks fantastic. You know, again, pretty much, you know, universally well received by the fan base and ourselves as, as a board of directors and executive and everyone working at the football club. So on the whole, I think we achieved a lot. Um, and, you know, that's just going to be an ongoing process now of improvements and as I always say, that, that's great, it's what the eye can see, but there's a lot of work that continues to be done in regards of health and safety that supporters don't see, but you know, enhances their match day safety and security on, on an actual match day. Mm. So overall, very pleased, but it's an ongoing process. Yeah, but things have happened nevertheless. Well, I, I, as I said, I've just named like five or six there that I think have happened and definitely improved. Um, ourselves as a football club and then fan experience. Yeah, yeah. Okay, and of course, following on from that, the usual desire for an update on the stadium timescales, etc. We did do an interview with Eric mm. uh, a few weeks ago, um, and he, he did touch on all that was going on and all that wasn't. Yeah, I think there's, um, I mean, we did say that the master plan was gonna take a, approximately a year when, um, Michael and Tonanti took over the club. That year obviously is coming to a close, so it's understandable fans are going to be saying what's happening. Um, is there going to be a, a big statement out there that we are going to be doing this on this day, that on that day, and, and this at some time in the future? I don't think so. I think we've been very, very clear in that, especially Michael as, as our chairman, um, supported by Tornanti and the executive, are minded to stay at Fratton Park. That is and continues to be the case. But it's like all things in life with any good business, you can't really lock yourself into a certain decision. And due to the commercial sensitivities around um, either staying or, or in the future, possibly leaving Fratton Park, you don't want to give too much away. But as I said, without giving too much away, the, the, the thinking is we are minded to stay at Fratton Park. Obviously, that is going to be de dependent on... Um, quite a number of issues, a lot of them are commercially sensitive, but even if a final decision was made, and I, I come out now and say, we are definitely staying at Fratton Park, which, which I'm not by the way, but you know, think in any business, you have to be flexible, you have to be nimble. So we have to keep all of our options open. Um, yeah. If I used an analogy, it would be, how many people have been in a home and go, I'm never gonna leave this house. And then things change. You have kids, you have grandchildren, they wanna move in with you, you know, and then, you know, you have to suddenly adapt and, and maybe move where you initially you didn't want to or didn't see a need to. But so as any business, you keep that flexible. But as of this minute in time, we are committed to the ongoing improvements of everything going on at Fratton Park while keeping our options open elsewhere. 
And as we've said to you in the past, and we said to Eric as well, just because you're not reading about it every month doesn't mean it's not happening. There's, there's not a day that goes by, seven days a week, 365 days in, in this first year of um, new ownership where the stadium hasn't been discussed at senior level at this football club. So it's very, very much something that is ongoing. Things do change. You can never fully commit yourself, but for all the time that we continue to remain at Fratton Park, there will be ongoing programme of works and improvements and we will just keep working as we do tirelessly to make it a better better fan match day experience whilst at the same time improving stadium safety and security without dismissing potentially moving in the future because you just never know and you can't tie yourself in like that. Do you agree with the criticisms levelled at the club regarding our transfer business or at the very least understand the frustrations of some of the fans who feel we're a bit short on players? I must admit, I've not heard of many criticisms. Um, I think you have to be careful that you, you, um, you know, you see five or six negative comments on the news or on Facebook or on Twitter and you take that as being all the fans. It's not all the fans. The vast majority of fans that I speak to and along with yourself at various supporter club meetings, um, Tony Goodall fans conference presidents. I mean, they're they're really pleased with the business that we've done. And and whilst I'm not going to pick individuals out, I think we're stronger all over the park. And if we're not stronger this year than what we were last year, then we have got competition for places in that certain area of the park. So we're still looking for a, a few more additions before the window closes. We will keep working, you know, as hard as we can, tirelessly to, to make us as strong as we can going now until the next window opens in January, where we are already working towards January, by the way. But um, I've, I've not had that general feeling of criticism about our signings as ourselves. I think we've made some great signings in the summer. Yeah, as you say, there are messages and there are messages and that's not the signal generally picked up, is it? It's not. And you know, we, we get emails in at the club, we, we're at various events and we pick up the, the feeling of, of the, what well, possibly are the silent majority, but everyone I speak to seems pretty positive about where we are as a football club on and off the pitch and in regards of the business that we've done in the summer, possibly, and, and as Kenny's said, so I'm not sort of saying anything contrary to Kenny, we are still looking for an additional striker to bring in before the window. Whether that happens or not, who knows, but we are tirelessly working to that. And, but it has to be someone that can compete. You don't want someone to come in and just sit on the bench. It has no. to be someone really that's going to come in and make a material impact for yeah. us. And they're not easy to find. And they're not easy to find. I mean, Brett has you know, struggled to get on the pitch for the first few games and he scored, what, 24, 25 goals last year. So. Mm-hmm. When people say to me, where's our 20 goal season striker? Well, we have actually got one, you know, but it's about the team. It's not about individuals or or goals. And and Brett will be the first to admit that, you know, it is a team team game, you know, and that's how we have to approach it, not for individual positions as such. Okay. Linked to that, is there any scope to make David Wheeler or Ben Thompson's loan moves permanent? There's there's nothing official, um, but... There's always scope to to make it um, more long term. I mean, you know, it depends how we do as a club during this season. It depends how Ben and David fit in here, their performances, whether they're happy here. And then ultimately they are other clubs' players. So it will come down to the other club whether they want to make it happen. But you can never totally discount it. But there's, there's nothing officially in either of their contracts to make it permanent, though. They do look two very astute little loan deals don't they yeah and, and that's what you want really you want you want a good solid base of your own players um, and topped up with you know a handful of, of loan players that you feel that can come in on short-term deals and and what the loans are great for as well it's it's for the following so you're always planning ahead mm. and what you want is that you, you want that flexibility because a loan deal is effectively a six month or a 12 month contract that then going into your season your following season, you have got that flexibility in the budget again to, you know, shift some players around and you haven't got all your team contracted at one point. So as an example, if things didn't go, you know, if we didn't have a great season this year, you don't want your hands tied because all your players are contracted and then you've got no room for manoeuvre in the following season. So there is a, a logic behind it. It's a complicated business, isn't it? You've got to think very far ahead. Yeah, you have. And it's and something Tony Brown, our COO, does Fantastically, he plots out, you know, pretty much daily of where we are, not just this year, next year, the year after. So we're always looking ahead. We're not just knee-jerk for this season. We're always planning ahead for the future. Yeah. 
Okay, let's change tack a bit. Public Wi-Fi at the ground, is it a possibility? It seems we can never get any signal in the stadium on a match day, which isn't always the case at other grounds, and sometimes is the case at other grounds. It is grounds. the case, yeah, yeah. I mean, it depends. I mean, I've been at Wembley and can't even get on my mobile phone via a, a traditional 4G network or, or via Wi-Fi. Um, so it is a, it's a very difficult thing to accomplish. It's clubs in the Premier League have spent million pound plus on Wi-Fi and still not cracked it and have complaints from people saying I couldn't get on at half time. And it, I mean, both for the traditional mobile network, so your you, you O2, your Vodafone and that, that's sort of out, out of our control, really. That They're independent networks that people's own independent um, telephone is, is linked to. Obviously, we have got no control over that. But again, pretty much at every club I've ever been at, I struggle to get on at half time and straight after full time. Um, there's no such thing as a, as a cheap option for this. It's going to cost many hundreds of thousands of pounds to do right. And even then, there's no guarantee that 18,000 people trying to get on at half time as soon as the, the half time whistle goes are going to be able to get on. So, again, then you'll have people upset because Joe Bloggs can get on, I can't get on, what's happening, you know, that type of thing. And it is all to do with the amount of simultaneous connections you can have to any one node. And, at the moment, it is, there's just not the technology out there that can um, guarantee that connectivity. So it's a case of do you ha do it halfway and spend hundreds of thousands? Do you limit your risk by spending the millions? And I, I just don't feel it's that big an issue at the minute that would warrant that type of expense. 10 to 15 years ago, wasn't a problem at all, was it? No, because you couldn't do it, yeah. But what? But you, you get, it's just one of them things, if we're going to do it, we need to do it properly. To do it properly is going to cost a million pound plus. Yeah. Right, back to playing side. What's happened to the sell-on fee from the deal that saw Adam Webster move from Ipswich to Bristol City? Well, that, that's come into the club. Um, and just, just to clarify to everyone that if you look at our transfer business in regards of transfer fees, not player budget, even with Adam Webster's money coming in, we still have a, a substantial deficit on the money that we've spent out for players and, and Adam Webster's money coming back in. So it's being reinvested. Um, I can 100% assure all fans that no money from any player sale has gone anywhere other than stay within the player budget stroke transfer budget. So that is still ring fenced all in there. So if we sold X player for X amount of millions, um, that, that stays ring fenced. That's the current thinking of our board. It's currently where we are as a football club. So you can never guarantee in the future what might happen, but no money has been taken out of the club in any other area of the club's expenses regarding Adam Webster. It's, it stayed inside and has been reinvested. I mean, over the summer, there was transfer fees for Anton Walks. There was transfer fees for the, the young lad that we got from Croatia. That's the youth team player, but great prospect for the future. There was transfer fees for Ronan Curtis. Uh, last year's transfer fees for Dion Donahue, for Brett Pittman, for Luke McGee. So I can go on. The money has been reinvested and will continue to be reinvested for the future. I mean, going back to that Webster deal, you got a few brownie points for that at the time. Yeah, was, it makes a change for me to get brownie points. <laughs> yeah, it was. Yeah. Um, I mean, look, it's, it, it was good business all round with, with Matt coming in. You know, um, you, you don't get everyone right, obviously, but no. In regards of Adam Webster, I, it was a great bit of business for the club, and you know, a great bit of business for everyone. And, and good luck to Adam. You know, is his new club. Okay. Why is one of the eights on the club crest upside down on club branded merchandise such as replica shirts? Um, I haven't got a clue, to be honest. I didn't know it, that. Yeah, well, it's it, it, it's hard to notice, but when you look at it, I mean, you have to be honest, it, it does look upside down. We have raised it with Nike. They are pursuing it with the people that do the um, actual embroidery on their shirts. But it went over, the file went over all OK, so we, we don't even know what's happened there. Okay. Again, look back to playing side. What's going on with Connor Chaplin? Clearly not in the manager's plans. So will he be allowed to leave? And I think that has been answered. So many times, yeah. I mean, again, at the end of the day, um, and, and I think this is good for Pompey fans to notice. And I'm not talking about Connor Chapman, so I'm just generalising at this football club as, as, as I did earlier um, when we spoke about the summer business. Yeah, Transfer business in regards of whether a player stays or leaves this football club, generally, not Connor Chaplin, mm. is completely down to the manager. Yeah. So even if we got an offer of £10 million for a certain player at this football club, 
it will still be the manager's choice. We will, we trust in our manager to make the best decisions. Now in that instance of a player being worth 10 million, Kenny will obviously make the decision. Can he strengthen, strengthen either in that particular position or does that give me enough money to strengthen the squad as a whole? You know, and then we'll listen to Kenny, we'll be guided by a view, his views. So whether Connor, the specific question goes or leaves is categorically 100% a decision for the manager and it will be on footballing decisions, not, not financial. Okay. Do the club receive any extra income for the domestic streaming of the Bristol Rovers game the other night and for the service generally? Yeah, just a very simple answer to that, yes. Yeah. Okay, so we, we benefit from that. Any plans to add a smoking area at Fratton Park? Plenty of space and it's something that is common at other grounds. I'm not sure it is common at okay. other grounds, yeah. I just got to be clear <laughs> about that. Um, you know, the um, smoking at stadiums is, is illegal. Um, we've got an added complication of two wooden stands. Listen, I'm not disputing it. There probably is designated areas that people could go out and smoke. Um, we haven't got any. It's not something that we're currently looking at because I don't know whether sports are aware of this, that even the area behind the fratten end, um, the, the second the game kicks off, that becomes an enclosed space and it becomes part of the stadium. So it's not like we could even allow it there. So it's Fratton Park's got its little intricacies. It is a difficult. And so it's not something that we are currently considering. Okay. Now, cup games like yeah. the other night, the Carabao Cup, um, we put Wimbledon fans in the south stand. That was a bit of an exercise, but worked quite well. Yeah, I think, look, based on my, my earlier comments and, and about, you know, things that we may be doing at Fratton Park in the future, uh, we did it last year with Chelsea in the, the Chelsea um, under 21 yeah. team, we, we put them in the, the fans in the north stand lower. So there is a period of experimenting going on to see what works, what doesn't work, things that maybe happened before at the club. You know, years gone by, people tell me that, you know, the away fans were in the south stand. So we just, apart from the fact of having to shut stands and the, the cost savings there, which is important, but it's not the primary. It really is a little bit of a case of let's, let's try some different um, areas to see if, if it works and could form part of a, a larger plan in the future, really. But to be clear, it's not finan financially viable to open the Milton End that it's, night, it, it? No, it's crazy to open the Milton End for X amount of 100 people because, again, it needs to be stocked with, um, you know, uh, the, the servicing and in the kiosk, as an example. There's a minimum amount of stewards it takes, and then it's the wider monitoring of the fans. It is better to keep them in, a, in, a, in an area smaller and, and more... Um, Easier, easier to manage, let's say, yeah. And, and listen, I, I was in the South Stand, it, it appeared to, to, to go okay, you know. So it's just one of them things that in the Cup games we're expecting a low capacity, um, a low attendance. We will be looking to, to experiment with a range of different ideas in regards of the away fans. Yeah, because in the old days, Pompey and most other clubs would get a 10,000 gate plus for the League Cup games. Yeah. And so there's no question then that you open the stadium. No, that's, that's it. But... As you say, I mean, I, I, you know, you, you get the same emails and, and letters as I do. There's a, there is quite a lot of fans that would say, that, why don't we give the Milton end back to home fans? You know, mm -hmm. having two sets of home fans from either end singing would create a brilliant atmosphere. Why don't we give the, the away fans the North Stand Up a lower or the South Stand Up a lower? So these are just little ideas. We listen to the fans. We experiment. We try. If it works, great. If it doesn't, you know, or it's not right at this particular time, then we just move on. But at least we are trying and we listen to fans and we sort of, you know, try to accommodate their wishes and um, it doesn't always work, but, but we do do our best. I mean, talking from a personal point of view, do you see the psychological advantage in that, having your fans at both ends? I can see that. Um, I grew up as, you know, as you know, West Ham fan and yeah. we always had the, the North Stand and, and well, it was our North South Stand, was it? Yeah. So it was behind the goals, yeah? yeah. So we, we always had that, you know, and, I, and we used to, Talk the can you hear the South Stand sing, you know, and the South Stand go, can you hear the North Stand sing, that type of thing. So, yeah, I mean, them chants have been going on for years, but you was taunting with your own fans, which, you know, added to, to the fun. And it, it, traditionally, behind the goals, I think, has generated more atmosphere. If you look at all the, the big, if you look at the cop at Liverpool as an example, and... Um, you know, clubs like that, it tends to be behind the goals that generates the most atmosphere. But not only that, I mean, wouldn't Luton have got a psychological lift by shooting towards the Milton end and having their fans behind there? Yeah, that's what, 
So again, it, you, you, yeah, it, to take them fans away and put them on the side, I think from a from an atmospheric and, and giving you that little odd percentage point in regards of um, you know g generating a positive atmosphere from the fans, your own fans. Yes, I think having them behind the goals has got that slightly positive effect. But we have to marry that up here, obviously, with the logistical challenges of how do we get our fans into a different area, yeah. get them out safely, yeah. um, you know. And, and as, as you know, in football, it's you please this group of fans, you upset mm. that group of fans. You, it, there's never going to be a 100% right or wrong. But as I say, back to the, the experiment inside yeah. of it, um, that's what you're always trying to do, look to improve, look to evolve. Um, and and move on from there really so the season's gone well so far so far <laughs> um cliche one game at a time um you know we have had a good start uh, i don't i think everyone would you know even kenny would say we'd, we've not fired on all cylinders but we've been grinding out the results seems a really good togetherness there within the squad a good um, resilience and you know team ethic which is what we're working for and you know and it comes back to what do we want to achieve as a football club? We want to be the hardest working football club in the land. Um, mm. Our players work hard, our fans work hard to enable them to get the money to come here on a match day. I work hard, you work hard, Dan works hard. Everyone at this football club, will we will work as hard as what we can to achieve what we can. But, you know, football is a, is a funny place. You know, we could go on a four game losing streak now. That is just the nature of football, obviously, that's not what we want, but uh, it does happen, so we have to keep grounded. Um, and you know yourself, the season will be sat in a few months and go, wow, half the season's gone already. And let's just hope that we're in a, a good position at that point. Well, Mark, thank you very much. Thank you very I, much. I, I forgot what a pleasure this was. Oh, did you? It's only been a month, isn't it, we've missed. <laughs> anyway, all right, thank you, Johnny. Thank you. Cheers.